I wanted to be at Texas State. Uh, I chose to be at Texas State. Uh, I'm from Texas. That was important to me. Um, I always knew if the right guy got this job, you better watch out. You better watch out. This is Win Now or Get Bent, episode 109. If you don't already know, I'm Kev Tardello, coming to you on Tuesday, July 11th. And I've got new headphones. Check them out. Yeah, check out, check them out. Thanks to Zach Webb hooking me up on my birthday, getting me some new headphones. I was using those old school iPhone ones, and he was tired of looking at it. So appreciate that. They sound great. They look great too. Thanks, thanks to Zach. Uh, today we have Jude McLaren. Some of you may remember him from the KTSW. He broadcasted a lot of Texas State games while he was in school, went on to the Daily Record. Now he's doing his own thing on YouTube, SSPN, got a Spurs podcast. He's also doing basketball and brew, covering some San Marcos Rattlers. So go check him out. Great conversation with him. He's a guy, he knows a lot about the Bobcats. Uh, he's, he's lived in this area, in the Kyle area, since he was a kid. He even talks about how he remembers them completing Bobcat Stadium and, and finishing that. I say complete. But it's a horseshoe right now. Maybe they'll they'll complete it into a full stadium at one point. But for now, they got to do those renovations at the at the end zone complex, which we still need an update on. Waiting on all the staff to get back and get into their meetings. So hopefully, I can get some more clarity on that this week. But before we get to Jude, this episode is sponsored by Austin Patchmaster. Austin.patchmaster.com. Any drywall repair you need, any cracks in your walls or ceiling, popcorn ceiling removal, got to cover up some holes you punched after a tough Texas State loss, call my guys at Austin Patchmaster, austin.patchmaster.com online. Their phone number is 512-200-3888. It's 512-200-3888. My guy Michael Clements over there is a true Texas State sicko. Texas State grad himself. Thank him for sponsoring us over the summer. Uh, again, that's 512-200-3888. 512-200-3888. Austin.patchmaster.com. And we are also sponsored by the Galindo Collective. TGC LLC. My guy over there, Rick Galindo, a Texas State grad, a true sicko himself. They are business consultants, a team of professional consultants dedicated to helping others realize their business potential through people, planning, and practice. Their services cover a wide range of areas such as business strategy, marketing, human resources, and financial planning. They offer full service solutions on general business evaluations, but specialize in residential and rental properties, commercial operations, and construction. If you own property and want to maximize its profitability, contact TGC at thegalindocollective.com. That's Galindo, G-A-L-I-N-D-O, thegalindocollective.com. And follow their social media platforms on Twitter at TGC underscore LLC. And they are the Galindo Collective on Instagram and Facebook. And Threads. Is Threads dead yet? I don't think so. It's almost there, I think. Apparently, if you delete it, you delete your Instagram. So they trapped a bunch of people. So go find the Galindo Collective on Threads or Instagram or Facebook. Are they on TikTok? I don't think so. We need to get on TikTok over here. But shout out to the Galindo Collective, sponsoring the next 50 episodes. And they're hooking us up, getting us to Sunbelt Media Day at the end of this month. Can't thank them enough. Really excited to be pushing them all season long. All right. Let's get to a little bit of Bobcats. Not really Bobcats. Not a lot of news going on, like I was saying. that vacation time of year, now it's kind of a, a little bit of a lull, but I think things will start to pick up as far as recruiting, and then we'll have Sunbelt Media Day, and then fall camp will start at the beginning of August. I know some of you hit up my DMs asking about when does when are they getting back to real practice and not these summer workouts. That'll start in August. I'll get an official date on that soon. Like I was saying, they're all kind of back in the office now, so we're going to get a lot of uh, questions answered. I've had some people ask about season tickets. How many season tickets have the Bobcats sold? What's the what's the update on the renovation process of the end zone complex? And uh, what's the update on all these donations? All of those questions I, I haven't forgotten, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get some answers to them this week. Uh, before we get to Jude, because I'm gonna I'm gonna keep this brief, a little intro and everything. Uh, the the last episode we did the top ten Texas State wins since 2008. I had a lot of fun doing that. It seemed like a lot of you had fun watching it and 
responding to it. And I, I uh, most for the most part, I, I didn't have too many people disagree with the list, but they did have some omissions that they wanted me to to talk about. Uh, if you didn't hear the episode, you should go listen to it. But I'll I'll, get, I'll go over the ten real real fast, and then I'll talk about three games that two games that I should have added, maybe even at least an honorable mention, and one that might should have been a little bit higher. Uh, but number ten, I had Georgia State in twenty nineteen triple overtime win for the Bobcats thirty seven thirty four. Number nine, I had SFA in 2012, 41 to 37 win for the Bobcats. Number eight, I had South Alabama in 2021, four overtime win, 33 to 31 for Texas State. Number seven, I had Tulsa, 2014, triple overtime win, 37 34. Number six, I had Arkansas State in 2020, 47 45 win. Number five, I had Ohio in 2016, overtime win, 56 to 54. Number four, I had Wyoming, 2013. It was a 42 to 21 win for the Bobcats, the debut of Tyler Jones, the the lightning delay game. Number three, I had App State in 2022, 36 to 24 win for the Bobcats. Number two, I had Sam Houston State in 2008, 48 45 win for the Bobcats. That was an overtime win to clinch the Southland Conference. And number one, Houston, 2012, the 30 to 13, the the first ever upset by a team that was 34 points or more uh first time they won by double digits when they were that much of an underdog so those were the 10 we talked about go go watch the episode it's good 45 minutes going through all those talking about the games but let's talk about some of your comments and submissions afterwards because there's one game in particular that i after after hearing from my my real good buddy carl shoning friend of the pod you know him he's been on here before he was one of the first people to reach out even before he witnessed the list and said i hope the game i'm thinking of is on it and it wasn't but we're going to talk about it here because reevaluating it this is the one game that i will add to this list in fact i won't just add them i'm going to put them at number nine and i'm going to push back that sfa game in 2012 Back to number 10, and we're going to take off the Georgia State in 2019, that triple overtime game. But I'm going to put this one, so it's going to be back-to-back SFA at number 10 and number 9, because the new number 9 now is going to be 2010 SFA. Now, this was a game that was in, in when I cut, wrote for the University Star, it's 2008-2009, 2010. So this was the the last season of that. I don't know why this one slipped my memory, but as I was talking about it with Carl, it kind of came back. I was like, oh man, that's right, that big comeback win. So 2010, Bobcats are playing SFA at SFA. It's the Lumberjacks homecoming game. Uh, Tyler Arndt was the quarterback for the Bobcats. Not in this game, but for that season, tore his ACL the week before. Uh, I can remember now that ACL injury affecting him for the rest of his career is kind of hard for him to bounce back after being a highly touted recruit in high school. Uh, so Tim Hawkins got the start for the Bobcats. Bobcats go down 24 to nothing over the first three quarters. They enter the fourth quarter uh, uh, down three touchdowns and a field goal to the number three FCS team in the country at the time with SFA. SFA had been on a, a long winning streak. They hadn't lost since week one, and I think it was against a P5, maybe A&M. Um, but, yeah, Tim Hawkins, he he brought him all the way back in that fourth quarter. He scored a touchdown himself. He threw another two touchdowns. Bobcats take that game. Big old, big old comeback. All, all their points in the fourth quarter, uh, which is pretty incredible. Tim Hawkins, 124 yards rushing and a touchdown, 18 for 25 passing. Uh, with 194 yards and two touchdowns. Not bad in relief of Tyler Arndt. Tim Hawkins, a lot a lot like Rutherford, dual threat style quarterback that really came in and in moments that they needed him because of injury or whatever the circumstance, he came in and, and really played hard. So I'm glad I got I get to give him a little bit of a shout out. Saw the name Demarcus Griggs when looking at the box score as well and, and just brought back some memories. That guy was a heck of a receiver. Uh, but yeah, I, I would if I would redo this list, that's the only redo I'd have where I would put this game at number nine and I would just completely take off the Georgia State game. Now, two other games that people brought up that this next one should have been honorable mention, 
Uh, I even, I remember thinking about it and thinking about a specific play and then I heard it from two different people. So I was like, well, you know, I'll at least address it on the next pod, but that's 2013 Southern Miss. Uh, it, it wasn't necessarily a, a, a blowout or, or a, it was a close game, but really the big play was, was the, was Craig Mager, terrific corner drafted in the third round in 2015 Southern Miss player caught the ball. Uh, and Craig Mager goes in there and strips it from him, catches the strip, runs it all the way back for a touchdown in the fourth quarter. That was It's one of the best plays that I've seen the Bobcats have. Uh, and apparently it's somebody, I think it was Bobcat Josh, might be Bobcat Josh from Maroon and Golden.com. Shout out to those guys over there. I think he said that it was the first time that Southern Miss had lost a season opener in like 30 years or something like that. And so it was a pretty big moment for that. I don't personally remember that that little note of the game, but that's a pretty big deal if that was the case. Uh, and then the only other note I have is the Tulsa game in 2014. I have it at number seven. I had someone chime in. I, I wish I wrote down who it was who chimed in, but I'm really glad they did, saying that game should be higher because of the David Gish implications going into it. A uh, high emotional game. If you don't know who David Gish is, he was a longtime athletic trainer here at Texas State from 1998 to 2014. I think I have those. Yeah, that's right. 1998 to 2014. He was the trainer here, passed away from cancer back in 2014. Uh, I, I believe it was right before this game, and so emotions were really high, and uh, that went into the outcome that you saw the triple overtime game bobcats went 37 to 34 uh in that season and that was that 2014 season we've talked a lot about where bobcats got snubbed and and all of that so but that's a that's a big win from that season and it for it was it was big even without the emotional implications but it's even bigger when you think about that because david gish touched a lot of people here um i know that's somebody that people still talk about with reverence even almost a decade after he passed so Thank you to whoever submitted that. It's definitely a worthy note and needs to be added on the record. Uh, but that's it. I'm going to keep the intro short. Like I said, I want to get to Jude. He and I talk for a good 35 minutes, talk about a, a, a multitude of things, Bobcats to Wimby to the state of local journalism, not local journalism, mainly traditional journalism. Some of you may have seen the New York Times is disbanding their sports section the horn in Austin, which I was just on on Friday. I tweeted about it. A lot of you said, hey, good job on that. Well, now it's gone, I guess. That's what everyone's saying. The horn is no more. It's it's interesting how things are changing. Uh, obviously, I still work for a traditional media company in the Austin American Statesman, writing about these Bobcats. I've been doing that for seven years now, coming up on seven years later this month. And, and the whole time I've I've been doing it, I've kind of, you could, it, it's pretty obvious that this is, this has been the case for a while that these companies are losing money and they're laying people off and, and all of this. And it's a big reason I started this pod. Uh, I mean, there is a, a variation I did the fifth quarter four years ago. I mean, even as far back as then I was like, okay, you know, who knows? Probably I could get laid off any moment. I need to have a backup plan because I need to keep continuing to cover these Bobcats. And this is my way of doing it. No matter what happens with, with, with the statesman or any other traditional media, I will be here. I'm going to be doing this for for you guys, for myself. No one's going to give it to you. You got to take it yourself, you know? So here I am taking it myself. Win now or get bent, not just on the field, but in your professional careers as well. I know I, I say it to myself. You should say it to yourself. Don't don't accept losses. Uh, just because the, 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 the landscape of, of the of your career path isn't as uh you know shiny as some of these other jobs no doubt it's uh it, you got to you got to pivot you got to prepare you got to have plan b c d e and f maybe all the way to z who knows but yeah it was great to talk to Jude uh you know a little bit of wimby talk sorry for all you all you Spurs haters out there i had to do it you know they, we finally got to see our our shiny baby boy out there playing basketball but Jude, Jude, I'm going to have Jude on more. I know he's got a real passion for the Bobcats. He's he's uh, still around in the area. I'm going to have him come out to some practices with me. And who knows, maybe I'll jump on SSPN with him, talk a little Spurs, if any of you want to see us talk about that. Uh, but hang around for Jude. Really glad he jumped on here. Another shout-out to Austin Patchmaster, austin.patchmaster.com. 
and to TGC, the Galindo Collective.com. Thank you to both of them for sponsoring us. Shout out to Win W N O G B dot com. The website, when now or get bent.com also works. It'll take you to the same one, but W N O G B is easier to type. Check out the gear, the shirts. Bam. We're about to start introducing some more out here coming soon. So check out that website. All right, everybody. Let's get to Jude. Thanks for tuning in, sickos. This whole thing is impossible without you. Oh, there we go. Win now or get bent. A very special guest on this episode of Win Now or Get Bent. I am joined by Jude McLaren, host of the SSPN Spurs podcast, uh, co-host and producer of Basketball and Brew, a local podcast here in San Marcos covering the Rattlers. Uh, he's formerly KTSW, Texas State grad. Worked at the San Marcos Daily Record for a while. Man, you've got a long resume, Jude. How are you doing today? <laughs> well, thanks for that intro, Kef. It's I got to tell you a story to start this off just because I, I think it's fitting. Um, you know, a lot of you guys might know me from from covering Texas State during my time at the, the student radio station and then, of course, my time at the Daily Record as the sports editor for a little bit. But even before then, I was a podcast producer there and just a freelance uh, reporter as well. So you might know me from there. But uh you know, my freshman year, Kef, after I applied to KTSW for the first time, I'm like, OK, I need to get my Texas State sports knowledge up. I went on Twitter. The first tweet I saw was you tweeting about the Everett Withers firing and just everything going on with then. And I don't want to get into too many details, but I was in the football dorm. I'll just say that. And I was like, I don't know if this is true. And then it was like, OK, it, it is a little bit true. <laughs> And that was just kind of my introduction to, to Texas State sports a little bit that involved you. Wow, what an introduction. And, and you're still here, still still yep. talking about the cats. That's good that, yep, that, that didn't on. sour you. Now, you, you said you were in the football dorm. Were you around football yes. players? What, what yes. were they saying about? This is very really interesting. Oh what were gosh. they saying about all that? Well, it was just, I'll just say that there was something that, that you were talking about that had to do with the athletic director at the time coming in and talking to them. Oh, and, and not knowing their names. Was it that? Yes. One? Yes. Names. And, and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they agreed that he didn't know their name. <laughs> Put it that way. <laughs> yeah. So oh I'll gosh. even, I'll even for, for some people that can't remember it's back in 2018 with all of that. That's so scary. as part of, as part of some of that, the, the withers, leaving and, and the fallout with Tice and all of that part of that was when he when Larry Tice went to go address the players after he had let Withers go because he let Withers go uh the week before the final game so Chris Woods was the interim coach for that last game but Tice went to go address the players and talk to them and I guess Tice said something like I care about all y'all I love all y'all and one player I, I don't know exactly what player I've heard different rumors who it is but I won't put that out here uh, looked at him and said, you don't even know our name. What's my name? And I stood there in front of like a hundred guys, not knowing his name. And that's, they all kind of, uh, and I not booed him out of the room, but you know, they, they convinced him to leave, I guess, by, by not liking that answer. But yeah, that was, that was an awkward situation. Thank you for confirming some of that. You know, I knew Imagine it was true. hearing that like your freshman year in the dorm, you're just about to get into sports reporting. You're like, all right, let me learn some stuff. That's the first tweet you see. And then later you're in the hallway with some people on the team and they, they tell you exactly that. I was like, wow. All right. Hey, you know, I, you know, there's some other, there's some of those others that I'll have to pick your brain on, on yeah. off air. See if, see if you can confirm any of them for me. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's different times now. Yeah, uh, yep. new new athletic director and Don Coriel, mm -hmm. new school president Dr. Kelly Danfis, new head coach with GJ Kenny. I mean, there's a lot of new changes around here. Someone who's you've had your eyes on this program for a, a while now. You just said it since your freshman year in 2018. Does it feel different when you, when you think and look at this team and talk about it? Does it just does does it feel a little different than years past? I mean, absolutely. I, you know, I had a little bit of background just being semi from the area. You know, my dad was in the military, so I, I grew up kind of all over the place. But for the most part, I've been in Kyle, which is just up the road from San Marcos. So I remember, you know, when the stadium, you know, the new part of the stadium got built, you know, when the bridge got built, I kind of watched, watched all of that. I granted, I didn't know too much about the program. I knew they were struggling. I knew they got into the whack. Like that was really all I knew from, you know, the little bit in the NCAA football game before before that got it ended up getting canceled um 
hopefully that can come back all all you know stuff running because we saw some lawsuits but but back to texas state um just from my knowledge with the spavital transition and you know there was a lot of optimism back then from at least from my perspective it seemed like when he came in you know with his tenure with johnny manzel working with kyler murray you know all those quarterbacks uh will greer's another one you can go down the list you know it seemed like things were really turning for the positive obviously the results weren't there during those four years there were a lot of questions about recruiting and that's kind of gets me into what makes me feel like things are different and it's not just and, it, and it's down to recruiting and obviously that's all you can really go off of right now with gj kenny hasn't played any games yet um but when it comes to not just the talent that they're recruiting that texas state has never had before uh, at least when it comes to ratings um and then on top of that, just the sheer amount of like high school guys and, and people in general that they're bringing in. It, it just seems like the framework in the infrastructure are in a better direction. Yeah, the foundation is laid. They just need to build the house now, basically. Uh, you know, you and I, we've talked about it before. We talked about um, TJ Finley. Yeah, you, you watched a lot of LSU growing up. So you're pretty familiar with TJ Finley. Obviously, he had his struggles at LSU and then a little bit at Auburn as well. But do you think coming down from what you've seen from him, do you think coming down from an SEC program to the Sun Belt, do you think that's going to be beneficial for him? Does that does that work with with his skill set, you think? I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to to see how it plays out. Um, obviously, you can't compare Sun Belt defenses to, you know, defenses in the SEC West at LSU and Auburn. Um but at the same time, you know, I think I think a fresh start is going to be good for him. I think not being under the bright lights of the SEC because he's from I, I, I don't know. I don't want to mispronounce the name. He's from some town that starts with a P in Louisiana. That's <laughs> super long anyways. <laughs> but he kind of grew up in that world. You know what I mean? So this will kind of be his time, you know, not necessarily to get away from it because it's still D1 college football. Um, but at the same time. Uh, I, th- I think that it'll definitely be a good good transition for him in the sense that just being away from all of those bright lights and the- but yeah where where you were at before that before it, it went out is you were talking about tj finley getting away from the bright lights and, and that's something yeah. i kind of agree with that there is it, you're kind of under a microscope when you're in these sec programs especially ones like auburn lsu some of the big dogs in there and it comes somewhere where the he's not being hounded by the press. I mean, the most he's getting is me DMing him, being like, "Want to come on my pod?" You know, there's not really a whole lot of people bothering him right now. So I think that'll be good for him to not necessarily disappear, but just kind of right. back back away from the the limelight a little bit. And if and if he does create a limelight, that's from his really good play here. I think that'll be that'll be beneficial for him. But I, I'm really interested to see both the SEC quarterbacks. Yeah, we saw Malik Hornsby in the spring speedster type guy but two different style of quarterbacks because tj finley you know him pretty well from from watching the lsu tigers <laughs> not a dual threat quarterback no. by any means. yeah so, pocket passer pocket passer and you see malik hornsby is definitely that dual threat so it'll be interesting to kind of see where they go with that with that whole situation but it, it's going to be a completely different team than than last year that's for sure Yeah, absolutely. And another thing, I guess, with TJ, you know, I did just call him a pocket passer. And obviously, when you go off of the SEC tape, that's what you have to say if you just want to be objective. Um, But at the same time, you know, being in the Sun Belt and and also just being in a new system under G.J. Kinney, maybe they can help work in some of that mobility a little bit. Maybe we can see a little bit more movement from him just, you know, with the football this year being creative if he ends up winning the starting job. Um, but but I think him being back in San, being in San Marcos, I think is just going to be a good like laid back spot for him. Hey, just play football with GJ Kinney. Let's run this offense that, you know, we just saw do incredible things with another former LSU quarterback in Lindsey Scott with UIW last year. Um, you know, that that's another little funny connection there for TJ Finley. But, you know, him and Malik Hornsby. Malik Hornsby is somebody that I remember when Arkansas got him out of recruiting because he was so highly rated because of his speed as you just alluded to and that I forget which relay he won but he he won a certain Texas relay I believe might have even broke a record um if I'm remembering that correctly while he was in high school in Texas obviously that that the passing mechanics for me are the things that 
stick out of, of what he most needs to work on. It seems like that's what you guys saw in the spring game as well. I'm kind of just going off of what I've saw from him at Arkansas. He did play against LSU this year. Um, but his speed is dynamic. And, you know, he, I think might, you know, we'll see what GJ Kenny does. He, he's, you know, he's the offensive guru. I'm not. But I think, you know, maybe you could find him in some sort of like Taysom Hill role, like not saying he's going to catch the ball and stuff, but put him in for a read option, like use his skill set because he's dangerous in open space. Yeah, you know, you're the second guest I've had to suggest the Taysom Hill package. <laughs> I, I had Carl Schoening on and he brought up the same thing. So those are two two minds that I trust pretty well when talking about football. I, you know, I've always I, I go by the old adage, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterbacks, but. I, I think I think in, when you have all those tools in your chest, like you, you might want to utilize them to the best of your ability. So even if it's not like a Taysom Hill package from right. Malik, Malik Hornsby, it could be some sort of uh, athlete package um, where maybe both are on the field at the same time. I don't know what they're thinking, but it would be it, it would be hard for them to leave both those guys on the bench and not utilize yeah. the, the the special talents of both of them. But I mean, even with that, there's still even CJ Rogers. You covered a little bit of the bo- halfway of the season with the Bobcats last year. Didn't get to see any CJ Rogers on the field, but we'd see him in practice and everything. And and he's a pretty talented player as well. He was actually showing some uh, a lot of progression in the spring and, and seemed like he fits really well with this offense and everything. So I'm I'm very intrigued. I'm always intrigued going into fall camp to watch a quarterback competition, but I'm more so intrigued this year than in, in years past because most of the time it's been – I guess last fall, there was a little bit of a three-man competition. It was like Lane Hatcher versus Ty Evans versus maybe C.J. Rogers, but Rogers didn't get there till the end of July. So it was kind of like, okay, no no way they're going to put him out there this season. But a lot of us were anticipating that Ty Evans would at least get a shot, and that was a bit of a letdown. I, I don't think it's going to be a, a, a one-horse race this year, like how we saw Lane Hatcher the whole time last season. I think we're we're going to get a chance to see all three of those guys. And who knows, maybe even P.J. Hatter, the freshman coming in, love his tape. I know my producer, Zach Webb, loves his tape too. So uh, really, really excited to see what the quarterback situation is going to look like at Texas State. And we saw what G.J. can do with Lindsey Scott, which I didn't realize he went to LSU, which you mentioned. First year, 2016. I mean, he, there that? are a lot of different schools in between. But yeah, he's originally from Zachary, well, Louisiana. They, yeah, I, I knew he had a bunch of of, of in-between before he he ended up at Incarnate Word, I guess I didn't realize the very beginning of it was LSU. I probably read Les that. Les Miles time. recruit, isn't that crazy? Wow, Les Miles, <laughs> man, man, he's even before before the Coach O days. Yeah, yep. um, but yeah, you, you could see the similar trajectories. There, I think they're two different style quarterbacks. Definitely, Finley, Finley very and, different. Yeah, Finley is is not not the. I wouldn't call Scott as much a dual threat as like Malik Hornsby, but he's still a, a dual threat in my yep. opinion. He can take off with his legs. But it's interesting, kind of that journeyman trajectory. I wonder if that will, if if that pattern fits in with with the system and and what they're looking for and trying to give someone a a, a third chance. I was about to say a second chance, but a third yeah. chance. So, but yeah, quarterback, quarterback. That's the number one thing I want to look <laughs> at going into to fall camp. Um, offensively, I, I'm I the other part. Or I'm sorry, defensively is the defensive line. All these new guys. Um, you remember Ben Bell from last year? Oh yeah, and how big he was looking. But they yep. went in and brought in ten other defensive linemen. So I, I'm I'm anticipating that wow. that the the drop off from that front seven from last year, how they were so strong. I don't think it's going to be as bad as we thought. For all these defensive linemen, they're bringing in Sam Latham, the Incarnate Word transfer. He's a big guy coming in as well. Uh, so those those are the two that I, I'm I'm real excited to see. Are you? Am I going to be able to get you to come out to some fall camp practice? I know you're not officially oh, on the beat, but you'll have to come if, sit with us yeah. and check it out. Hey, if if you if you want to invite me out there and I'm free, I'm I'm there. Yeah. I'm not just saying that either. Seriously, I love college football. So if it's right down the street and I got an opportunity, I'm there. Hey, you know what? I found out you're still right here in Kyle. I was like, <laughs> hey, you know, I got I gotta I gotta get this guy on my pod, get things still going. Hey, uh, but yeah. But- or not to interrupt you, but going back yeah. to the D line, you know, just want to touch on that a little bit, because when you talked about the state of the program, you know, in college football, I think the one thing I really learned covering like even high school football too, high school and college football over the past, you know, when I was in school for four years, the line of scrimmage is so important. So regardless of the quality of those players, although I, I definitely believe in that with GJ Kenny's staff, um, 
just to have that depth there and to put an emphasis on that depth is another good sign for the foundation of the program like we were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, when you're in the fourth quarter and those big guys are getting tired, it's nice to put in some fresh legs. I absolutely agree. And it seemed like that, that's what they were really focused on was was fixing these both of the lines. Uh, yeah. I mean, when when they came in, a, a lot of offensive linemen hopped in the portal. That tends to happen a lot with these coaching mm-hmm. changes. I think offensive linemen are just real loyal guys. Uh, it just seemed like they were like, all right, we got to increase this profile. We got to make everybody bigger across the board, and we need to have a pair and a spare, two guys, and then a backup. So I, I, it's, 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 they set the foundation. Like we were saying, they've done a lot of really great things. It's just, it's, but like you said, when going back to 2018 with Spav at all, everybody was pretty excited then as well. And so I'm trying to temper my expectations, but I, I mean, the, it's as good a chance as any for this team to get to that six win threshold. I feel, I mean, it, it really, it, it just, it feels primed for it. They're not going to win the Sun Belt, I don't think. Right. The schedule's really hard, but I, I think it's it's finally that time they're going to get that monkey off their back. I, I think that's definitely the goal, you know, <laughs> and that was the goal last year too. Do you remember sitting at those those press conferences with with that being the thing? So you know, if you could do it in year one, that would definitely be a, a giant step for the program. Yeah, and, and you know, I, I even think back. After the App State game, they were three yep. and two. Because oh you were, oh my gosh, you were yep. you were still you were still doing the deal at the, after the App State game, right? You were still covering the Bobcats. <sighs> that might have been a little. I might have that might have been a, like right after. I'm not right sure, after. Though. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I was at the App State one actually, but I mean, I remember it. Like I remember paying attention to it at least. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say because if it if if you had left right after that, I, I was gonna blame you for the rest of the season. Then we went winning <laughs> one more game, but no, nah, I left before. <laughs> okay, good. My good. my goodbye present was the App State win. Oh, nice. Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm talking oh, no. about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, but it, it, at at that point, it was three and two, and the vibes right. were great. Everybody was real excited. Like, oh, okay, three more wins in conference, and and we can we can get to that six wins, and it didn't happen. Uh, so there's just been a lot of letdown in recent history. Yep. So I'm not not ready to anoint anything, but I, I'm as excited as I've been in a while for this, for sure. Uh, yeah. I met, I mentioned at the top, you do SSPN. What? Tell me what SSPN stands for. Spurs, a San Antonio Spurs <laughs> podcast, right? I always, I always Spurs. Well, you know, we're we're being a little bit um facetious with this it's spurs sports programming network ah there you go there you go okay it's Spurs. you know it, the spurs are all over espn right now but look when we started this in 2021 even even throughout all the years you know with all the success the 20 years of dynasty the 22 years straight playoffs you you know as a spurs fan kev and anybody who's watching who's a spurs fan you know it, it felt like we were never on espn unless it was the finals and we were in it you know, so that kind of is what inspired, you know, me and Ethan's name. <laughs> I like it. Oh, OK. OK. See, I Just guess to, I, did, you I know, didn't know the, give them the Spurs story. coverage, you know, because people go to ESPN looking for Spurs. They can't find it. Come to SSPN. There you, there go. you go. You don't need ESPN. You have <laughs> SSPN. See, now there you go. I'm glad you explained it because now <laughs> it's like now it's going to stick in my memory. Uh, but now it's a great podcast. Ethan Quintero's on there, too. Uh, Texas State grad himself. Uh, you, you know, obviously. The, all the talk is Wimby. I'm transitioning oh all you Tech State fans to some Spurs. <laughs> so if you want to tune out, you can. Maybe I'll maybe I'll pepper in some Houston Rockets talk, but not much. But Wimby last night, uh, first game didn't go great. Mm-hmm. Last night, Sunday night, it looked a lot better. When you saw the overreaction on Friday to to some of that, <laughs> what were you thinking? What was going through your mind when people were mad <sighs> at a 19 year old who had five blocks, nine <laughs> points, eight rebounds, didn't shoot very well, but very first game ever, but and then uh, to, to come out and get twenty seven and twelve and three blocks last night. What were you thinking Friday night? So I'm watching it, and during the game, I'm thinking, "Oh no, oh no!" Everybody, and not not. I'm not thinking, "Oh no!" Like this isn't good. He's a bust. That's not what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, "Oh no." The Twitter streets there or the thread streets. I don't even know what we're doing oh, anymore. They're they're gonna go crazy on this guy. Social media is just gonna destroy him for this. And you know, it, it was a little concerning just because it's like that's the only tape you've really seen. But the thing that I kept telling myself, you know, it's funny, after the game, guess what I went and did? I went and watched the Scoot Henderson versus Victor Wembenyama G League Ignite <laughs> Metropolitan's 92 highlights to remind myself that okay, this is like the the same caliber and this is what he can do and 
kind of what that reinforced in my mind was just that, you know, he hadn't played since since the LNB Pro A finals. Um, he hadn't really played. At, he'd practiced like maybe like once or twice. And and when you take a lot of time off of basketball, like you're going to have rough games. Like there's so many people coming back from injury. I mean, you can go down the list. I mean, obviously, when you have all of the things that people have been saying about this guy, of course, they're going to expect him to be the greatest thing on the court every single time he touches the court, just with the amount of hype that, that's going around him. But when you keep, you know, try to bring yourself back down to earth a little bit and, and push all of that to the blinders, the thing that I was reminding myself was just that this was his first time playing with this group. Everybody else knew where to go. And he even said in the post-game press conference, he opened it up. He's like, honestly, I don't I didn't really know what I was doing. I just went out there and, and tried to play, you know, and people might be like, oh, that's excuses, blah, blah, blah. But it's like if you really listen to what Brian Wright, this is a bigger Spurs rant. But if you listen to what Brian Wright, Greg Popovich and like just the players themselves, like if you go listen to what they actually say, like a lot of times they're not going to lead you astray. Yes, the Spurs are very secretive, but. Really, when Benyama was kind of just telling you exactly what happened out there, he only really played, if you want to be honest, like, or not on, uh, yes, honest. He only really played bad offensively. Like, yes, there were times he got got. You can talk about the Kai Jones dunk, even though he's going for the ball on that play. And if it's not somebody that tall, that's actually swatted out of bounds. Still, he got him for sure. And there's, there's going to be some physical adjustments. But his wingspan makes up for it with the five blocks. And then with his performance last night, it just kind of confirmed everything that that I was thinking. That's not to say that he's not going to have more strugglesome games. That's not to say that he won't have games even better than the one that he had last, last night. I think both of those things are going to happen. And when you get to the actual NBA, it's going to be a whole different animal. But I think these two games are the epitome of like just kind of some of the struggles that you can see from him but then also the the tremendous upside that you can see from this guy and maybe how quickly he can learn. Yeah, I I, I couldn't agree more with your assessment right there. And I also think on Friday night, a lot of that has to do with with how many eyes were on him. It's, you know, people have right. been talking about right. him for, right. for a long, long time. This was the first game that everybody's watching. It, it, Sold everybody, out. Sold out 100 and what 80 bucks a ticket for a summer league game. 19,000 people, basically 20k people. I mean, that's more than was in the Moody Center for both of the first two games. And they, mm-hmm. you know, they, they they sold that one out twice. Yeah. Yeah. And not to mention how many people are watching it on TV and talking about it on social media and the Britney Spears thing the night oh, before. Oh, yes. Yes. There's, there's a lot of pressure on yep. him to perform. And that's why you could see he was kind of forcing shots. Kept airing threes. I think his he aired a couple threes on Friday, and then his first one on Sunday before he made the next two. But you could tell that was he was in his head with some of that stuff. For sure, I mean, everything else that was a part of his game. I was like, "Yep, he has all the tools. He's there." If there's one critique I have, he's a little uh, he gets beat on rebounds real easily. Uh, yeah, little little soft in the paint. I just think he's not used to the NBA physicality quite yet, and he'll get there. That's something you can learn. But everything else, I see the tools, and it's it's as advertised, and it's pretty exciting to see what that guy can bring at seven five. You know, I guess seven three and a half with shoes, but at at that height to be able to just dribble and I mean, he's like a, a stretched it's out ridiculous. Kevin Durant. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot. No, it, it's a lot of fun. Good for us, right? Yeah, definitely good for us. <laughs> Man, you know, and and uh, I I guess we'll we'll have to to talk about this one because it has to do with our field. Uh, a lot of lot of cuts in traditional media, and it's actually really prudent to you and I personally because we we just met up at Fuego. Shout out to Fuego, great tacos yep. there, free plug. San Marcos. Uh, <laughs> we just we just we just met up there, and we were talking about we were talking a little bit about traditional media and your decision to to no longer write for the the paper here covering the Bobcats, but to continue to pursue it online with with YouTube and everything. And then when you take a look at at these cuts, like the New York Times completely doing away with the sports section. The Horn in Austin seems like they're going away. It's local, it's national, it's these big cuts. It's it, Does it feel, do you feel vindicated a little bit? Like, man, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I got out of that before before the wheels started falling off and, and started focusing on my own thing, like with a YouTube page, like both of us are doing, when now I get bent, SSPN. Um, when, you, when you look at that, how, do, how does it make you feel? 
honestly, I just kind of feel bad. Well, it, it seems like at least for for the New York Times, those guys were getting moved to the or those guys and gals were getting moved to the athletic. Um, it didn't seem like there were going to be any layoffs. It, I might have read that completely wrong, but um, I know at least for the horn too, and and for a lot of other places, just you know, around kind of the, the the sports media world, if you will, um, it's definitely a changing landscape. I, I honestly, I can't say I feel vindicated. I kind of feel like I just kind of lucked into it a little bit. Not lucked, but in the sense that when I say lucked, I mean I grew up kind of like on YouTube a little bit. You know what I mean? Like other people, maybe just like even 10 years, you know, older than me, you know, like it's almost like a completely different, you know, <laughs> landscape. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you have the internet, but you also kind of had the 90s, you know, as well, where it's just like maybe you got into something else and never really got, you know, super into that world. You know what I'm saying? To really know a lot about it, where to me, it was just kind of always a part of my life. So it, it was kind of something I always wanted to do. And you know, me and Ethan, Ethan sent me a text in, in March of 2021 and just said, hey, would you want to do a Spurs YouTube slash podcast show? And, you know, I've been doing my own solo thing for a while. I had done a done a lot of different stuff, just kind of talking about whatever I wanted to talk about. Um, but, you know, I, I, I remember never the really... LSU pod you did. Yep. Yep. That was way back in the day. <laughs> oh, yeah. Way back in the day. And you've been, and talk... you've been podding the whole time I knew you. <laughs> it's crazy to think about because I kind of forget about those days sometimes. Um, but I think the first time I ever started listening to podcasts, I just kind of fell in love with them. I always loved it. I, I just really liked the conversation. It felt like I was there. Um, it, it's almost just like listening to a hangout, you know, in, in, in some aspects of things that you like. Um, but getting back to me and Ethan, he sent me that text. I was like, okay, I've never, I've never had, you know, done it with somebody else. And while I do like solo shows, I really like one-on-one -on -one, specifically with two people um i mean i could like it with other people too but i definitely like having somebody else to talk to on podcasts and it like i said it's just something i fell in love with um it, it, but just going back to kind of the, the bigger picture stuff going on right now i i definitely am thankful that that i jumped on it when i did because i was doing that even before i joined the record um you know that was just kind of like my path after school it felt like it was the perfect opportunity for me you know, me and you talked about it. Obviously, there were there were some things, you know, you got to take care of yourself. I didn't feel like I was able to do that fully. Um, and so that's kind of the thing that I would say I feel vindicated about. I feel vindicated about that because I think there there are opportunities, like you're saying, in in the midst of all this where you don't have to be killing yourself and you can still pursue this type of stuff that you love. Absolutely. And, and I think that's a lot of people from the outside looking and don't realize about a lot of these media jobs is how much they do work. Cause you just, yeah. you see the article, you see the finished product, you see the tweets and it doesn't seem like you do a lot, but especially like the job you were doing where you're working on page design and worrying about print and all this other, all this other stuff that it almost feels like, like relics of the past when you talk about a printing press and all of that. And and all this extra costs and you can see all this overhead why the how these companies are losing yeah. money or if you just do it yourself you get a you get a, a camera you get a microphone you can just throw it up on youtube and get it going and it's funny that you say like you grew up with youtube it's that 10 year gap between us i'm 35 i think you're 23 right, right? yes sir yep. 23 yep and it is that is that gap right there because even me for a while i was like ah you know like how how serious do people take YouTubers and all of that? Mm. And and now when you look at it, it's 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 not that sports media, sports media in general isn't dying. It's pivoting. It's going to evolve yep. into something different. It's going to evolve into more podcasts and these. I I still can't believe the print and all of that. It still exists. I mean, I write for a newspaper still, the Statesman, <laughs> and they're still printing all the time and spending a ton yeah. of money to do that. And look what happens. They're doing layoffs and cuts all the time i mean it's a matter of time before my time comes with that whole yeah. situation but i'm prepared i got the pod i'm ready to go when it when it does happen and i think that's what was when you and i had that conversation a couple weeks ago that's what i was telling you it's like you're you're prepared for the the unknown path that lies ahead for everybody where it's like okay what's what sports media gonna look like not yeah. sure better start doing it for myself no one's gonna hand it to you you gotta go get it and that's something you've understood for a while. It's something I've respected about you. It's why I wanted to have you on the pod. And, and I'm glad you're still doing it, even almost a year, a year out from the daily record. 
And I mean, at 23, man, you're still so young. Uh, I was, I was, I was messing around way too much when I was 23. I didn't, I didn't start to really smarten up till like 25, 26 around there. So you're a little bit ahead of the curve there. <laughs> I but appreciate I, it, Cap. I mean, people listening, if you're looking at, at the, at the landscape of sports media, just know you, you got to support the, the people that you, that you yeah. are, are really in there covering your local stuff. Um, I, I mean the, the local podcasts, the local papers like the daily record. I mean, that's what, what keeps them alive. Um, it's, it's going to take more nuanced support from, from people and to know, but it's, it's going to be nice. Cause it's almost like all la carte instead of these national publications, right. you, can, you have your own curated, um, uh, stuff that, that you're into that you can follow and that you can be informed on and all of that. So it's changing and it's scary. And I, I think it's, 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 it's gotta be scary for a lot of people in it. And for some reason, I'm yeah. not, I'm not as scared just because I I've, I've, I'm surprised they're still going. I mean, these, a lot of these yeah. media companies are zombies that just haven't been brained yet. You know, they've been wandering yeah. around dead for over a decade <laughs> and just waiting for someone to put them out of their misery. I, I'm, I, I mean, I'm coming up on seven years at the Statesman and I'm yeah. surprised. I was like, I didn't, didn't anticipate to go seven years, but. I just got to mention this, not to cut you off. For those of you guys who don't know, many of y'all might know this show, the Pat McAfee show, which, you know, former NFL punter for the Colts. I mean, a lot of times on that show, I mean, they do cover news, but they it's a personality show. Like he kind of they goof off a lot. They make jokes. That's going to be the main show, main day show on ESPN starting this fall. I mean, it's I mean, if you would have told me that even like like a a couple days before it was announced, I would have probably thought it was crazy. Right. It, it does. It seems crazy, but it also seems really smart to me because I'm it like, is. oh, man, maybe I'll watch ESPN again because I love right? Pat <laughs> me too. Same. And, yep. I, and I've been so over the embrace debate culture. It's like we yes, don't. I can't know. stand it. That's just my opinion. I know people like it, but hot take. I hate hot takes because the world is gray. It's not black or white. There's so much yep. more nuance to everything. And we're like, oh, this is my point. I'm going to die on this hill like. There's not a point out there that I'm I'm willing to die for. And a lot really. of times it's scripted. Like it's just like you take this side, you take this side, right. regardless of what you actually believe. Yeah, and you can you can feel that, you know. Ah, you know, I I disagree with this. Like it's like you know, there's no way. I feel like Max Kellerman. What was it? Iguodala. Yeah. That <laughs> when he would last. So yeah. many Skip Bayless clips. <laughs> it's just it's bad. So hopefully that part goes away. That's right. the part I'm okay with. Uh, the the embrace debate, which I I understood why they they took that on, but I I feel like it's it's really messed up a lot in in how people talk about sports and yes how people interact online it's always just like somebody has to have a point and somebody has to have a yep. counterpoint it's like we can just talk about what is sometimes you know and what it, what it could be depending on how you look at it you're but. you're preaching to the choir here kef that's like one of my pet peeves it, it, like you said <laughs> there's so much more more nuance to everything and i get you know sometimes if you're just joking and you're being a hater just to be a hater like i get it like i sometimes do that too but yeah. like when you're just be like but you know, there are some people who are like really being serious about it and they're talking like that, you know, like uh, when most of the time you can tell whether somebody's joking about it or not. And yeah, that that's something that, that gets on my nerves for sure, because it's like this guy doesn't you know, this guy isn't trash or he isn't the greatest thing off of just one thing. Like there's a whole lot more context that goes into it. hundred percent. That's why I'm so reluctant to ever be like, oh, this athlete sucks, because especially right. covering D1 football, mm-hmm. all of these athletes, none are- of them <laughs> suck. Yeah. None of them suck. They're all they're like a lot. Most of them are like the the best guy from their their local Literally. area in a long time, and all of them are extremely more athletic than me. That's for sure. So I that's was... the other thing, though. Too that's the thing that really gets on my nerves. Kept this will be my last thing. Oh, is good. the people talking about it usually like they couldn't they could not even hold a candle to whoever they're talking about in whatever sport they're doing. It's so true. It's like when when Skip got called out for one point eight averaging from Jalen Rose. <laughs> That oh was, my that was gosh. great. I just hope no one ever pulls up my high school stats. Right. You know? I don't I don't need that. Minute sat on the bench. That's what I led the team on. But Jude, this was awesome, man. We're gonna do this more. Yes. I don't know. I, I don't think I said this at the top of this interview, but I'm gonna have Jude on a lot more. We're gonna be we're gonna be talking Bobcats. I'm gonna see how how often I can get him to come on and and talk about the cats this this upcoming season. Uh, you have a lot going on, SSPN, Basketball and Brew. Plug it away. Tell people where they can find you. 
Yes, y'all go on YouTube, SSPN, colon, a San Antonio Spurs podcast. If you're into the Spurs or if you just want to become a Victor Wembanyama fan, now's the time. Go hit that subscribe button at SSPN on YT. On Twitter, we do our live streams on there as well. You can interact with us, all that good stuff. And then, hey, all you San Marcans out there, go follow Basketball and Brew, support Dan Miller and myself, as well as local San Marcus businesses uh, in Pie Society and Zelix Ice House. Um we make a podcast about basketball. Coach Miller's the head coach at San Marcos High School. We've had Coach TJ on there. It's usually just, a, you know, some sort of college figure, former player, coach. So y'all go check it out. Thanks again, awesome. Jeff. I had a blast too, man. Awesome. Awesome, man. Jude, it's great seeing you. It's great talking with you. We'll, we'll see you out there, man. Yes, sir. Catch you later.